Chapter One, The Daddy. Ma Precious Ramotswe had a detective agency in Africa, at the foot of Kigali Hill. She was the only lady private detective in Botswana, and her agency was the best. So she called it the number one ladies' detective agency. Ma Ramotswe was a good detective and a good woman. She loved her country, Botswana, and she loved Africa too. The people of Africa were her people, her brothers and sisters. She wanted to help them solve the mysteries in their lives, so she became a private detective. The detective agency was in a small building in the town of Gaborone. Outside the building was a sign: "The Number One Ladies Detective Agency." For all private business, the agency had a tiny white van, two desks, two chairs, and an old typewriter. There was also a teapot and three large cups, one from Mara Motswe, one for her secretary, and one for the client. In front of the agency was a tree. When Mara Motswe was not busy. She loved to sit under this tree. It was a very good place to think. She could look across the dusty road to the town, and far away, she could see the blue hills. Hills in Botswana always looked blue in the heat. Mara Motswe thought about many things while she was sitting under the tree. She thought about her father, and the beginning of the Number One Ladies Detective Agency. Mara Motswe's father worked in the mines in South Africa for fifteen years. The mines were very dangerous; rocks fell and killed men. The dust destroyed their health. Mara Motswe's father saved the money from his years in the mines, and bought one hundred and eighty fine cattle. But the dust from the mines was still in his body, and he became ill. I want you to have your own business," he said to Mara Motswe on his deathbed. "Sell the cattle and buy a business, a shop perhaps." Mara Motswe held her father's hand and looked into his eyes. She loved her father, her daddy, more than anyone in the world. Now he was dying. It was difficult to talk through her tears. I'm going to start a detective agency," she said, "down in Gaborone. It will be the best agency in Botswana, the number one agency." Her father's eyes opened wide with surprise. But, but, but he died before he could say anything more. The number one ladies' detective agency. Became very successful. At first, business was slow, but then more and more clients came. One of Mara Motswe's first clients was Happy Papetsi. I have been lucky in my life," said Happy Papetsi as she drank tea in Mara Motswe's office. But then this thing happened. Mara Motswe watched Happy Papetsi's face carefully. Happy Papetsi was an intelligent woman. She also had few worries. There were no worry lines on her face. It is probably some trouble with a man, thought Mara Motswe. A man has come into this woman's life, and destroyed her happiness. I grew up in Maun, up near the Okavango River, said Happy. My mother had a small shop. We had lots of chickens. And we were very happy. My daddy left home when I was still a baby. He went to work in Bulawayo, up in Zimbabwe, and he never came back. So my mother and I decided that he was probably dead. But I wasn't sad about my daddy because I didn't remember him. I did well in my school examinations. After I left school, I got a good job in a bank. Now I am thirty-eight years old. I earn a lot of money, and I have a nice house with four rooms. 
I am very happy. Mara Motswe smiled. You have done well, she said. But then this thing happened, said Happy Bapetsi. My daddy arrived at the house. Mara Motswe was surprised. So it was not a problem with a boyfriend. It was a problem with a father. He just knocked on the door, said Happy Bapetsi. It was a Saturday afternoon, and I was taking a rest on my bed. I got up and went to the door. A man of about sixty years old was standing there with his hat in his hands. I am your daddy, he said. Can I stay with you? He told me my mother's name. I was very surprised, but I was also excited. My mother was dead. I was happy to meet my daddy. I made a bed for him in one of the rooms and cooked him a large meal of meat and vegetables. He ate it very quickly and then he asked for more. That was about three months ago. Since then, he has lived in that room and I have done all his work. I make his breakfast, cook lunch for him, and then supper at night. I buy him one bottle of beer a day, and I have also bought him some new clothes and a pair of good shoes. He just sits in his chair outside the front door and gives me orders. Hmm, many men are like that, said Mara Motswe. Yes, Happy Bapetsi agreed. But I don't think that this man is my real daddy. Perhaps he heard about our family from my real daddy before he died. So he came to Botswana. He has found a very good home for himself. Can you help me? Can you find out if this man is really my daddy? If he is, then he can stay with me. But if he is not, then I want him to leave. Yes. Said Mara Motswe. I'll find out. All that day, Mara Motswe thought about Happy Bapetsi's daddy. How could she find out if he was the daddy or not? She thought for a long time. Then she had an idea. Mara Motswe had a friend who was a nurse. This friend was a large lady, like Mara Motswe. Mara Motswe borrowed her friend's clothes and put them on. She looked just like a real nurse. Then she drove to Happy Bapetsi's house in her tiny white van. The daddy was sitting in his chair outside the front door, enjoying the morning sun. Mara Motswe stopped the car and ran quickly up to the house. Are you Happy Bapetsi's daddy? she said. The daddy stood up. Yes, he said proudly. I'm very sorry, but Happy has been in a car accident, said Mara Motswe. She is very ill in the hospital. My daughter, cried the daddy. My little baby, Happy! Yes, Mara Motswe continued. Happy is very sick, and she has lost a lot of blood. We must get more for her. Yes, said the daddy. They must give her that blood. Lots of blood. I can pay. The money is not a problem, said Mara Motswe. Blood is free, but we don't have the right kind. We will have to get blood from someone in her family, and you are the only person. We must ask you for some blood. The daddy sat down heavily. I am an old man, he said. Yes, said Mara Motswe. That is why we are asking you. Happy needs a lot of blood, so we will have to take about half your blood. It will be very dangerous for you. Dangerous, said the daddy. Yes, said Mara Motswe. But you are her father. We know that you will want to help your daughter. Now come quickly. Or it will be too late. The daddy opened his mouth and closed it again. Come with me, said Mara Motswe, taking his wrist.
I'll help you to the van. No, said the daddy in a weak voice. I can't go. I am not really her daddy. There has been a mistake. You are not her daddy, said Mara Motsway angrily. Then why are you sitting in that chair and eating her food? Do you know that there is a law in Botswana against people like you? The daddy looked down at the ground and shook his head. Go inside that house and get your things, said Mara Motswe. You have five minutes. Then I am going to take you to the bus station and you are going to get on a bus and never come back. When Happy Papetsi returned home, the daddy's room was empty. There was a note from Mara Motswe on the kitchen table. As Happy read the note, she smiled. That man was not your real daddy. He told me. Maybe you will find your real daddy one day. Maybe not. But now you can be happy again. Chapter 2 Note Makoti Mara Motswe grew up in a small village called Machudi. When she was very young, her mother died in a terrible accident, so a cousin of her father's came to look after the little girl. The cousin made her clothes, took her to school, and cooked meals for Precious and her father. The cousin wanted Precious to be clever, so she taught her to count. They counted cattle and trees and boys playing in the dust. She helped Precious remember lists of things, the names of people in her family, and the names of cattle. When Precious went to school, she knew the letters A to Z, and her numbers up to 200. She also knew a few words of English. Every Sunday, Precious went to Sunday school at the church. There, she learned about the difference between right and wrong. She understood this very well. It was wrong to lie. It was wrong to steal. It was wrong to kill other people. When Precious was eight, the cousin got married. Her husband was a good, kind man, and he was rich too. He owned two buses. After the wedding, the cousin and her husband went to live in a house 16 kilometres south of Gaborone. The cousin wrote letters to Precious. I know you are missing me, but I know too that you want me to be happy. I am very happy now. I have a kind husband who has bought me wonderful clothes. One day you will come and stay with me and we can count the trees again and sing. Now you must look after your father. He is a good man too. At the age of 16, Precious left school. She is the best girl in this school, said the head teacher. One of the best girls in Botswana. Her father wanted her to stay at school, but Precious was bored with the small village of Machudi. She wanted to go somewhere. She wanted her life to start. You can go to my cousin, her father said. That is a different place. You will find lots of things happening in that house. He felt sad when he said this. He wanted Precious to stay and look after him. But that was selfish. Precious wanted to be free. She wanted to feel that she was doing something with her life. Her father was worried about men too. There are a lot of bad men in the world, he thought. Perhaps Precious will choose the wrong kind of husband. The cousin was pleased to have Precious in the house, and she gave her a bright, comfortable room. Precious was given a job in the office of the bus company. She had to check the numbers in the driver's books. Two other men worked there, but Precious worked much harder. They sat at their tables and talked and drank tea. You are working too hard, they said. You are trying to take our jobs. 
Precious did not understand. She always worked as hard as she could. One day, she found a mistake of two thousand pula in the company's books. She showed the mistake to her cousin's husband. Someone in the company was stealing money. It was one of the men who worked with Precious. The man lost his job. That was the beginning of Mara Motswe's detective work. Precious worked in the bus company office for four years. Every weekend, she travelled up to Machudi, on one of the company's buses, and visited her father. She told him about her week in the bus office, and he told her about his cattle. One day, on the way back from Machudi, she met Note Makoti. Note was wearing a red shirt, and he had a proud, handsome face. Next to him on the seat was a music case. When the bus stopped in Gaborone, he got off. This was not her stop, but Precious got off too. Note was standing there, smiling at her. I saw you on that bus," he said. He pointed to the case at his feet. "I am a musician. I play in the bar at the President Hotel. You can come and listen. I am going there now." They walked to the bar, and he bought her a drink. She sat at a table at the back. Then he played, and she listened. She felt proud that she was his guest. She had a boyfriend now, a musician. The following Friday, outside the bar and away from the noise of the drinkers, Note Makoti said, "I want to get married soon. You are a nice girl, and you will make a good wife. I will speak to your father about this. I hope you will not want a lot of cattle for you. But first, I must teach you what wives are for." He put his arm round her, and moved her back in the soft grass. Then he started to kiss her. Girls must learn this thing. Has anybody taught you? He asked. She shook her head. Good, he said. Then I will teach you, right now. He hurt her. When she asked him to stop, he hit her across the face. Then he kissed her. He was sorry, he said. But then he hurt her again, and hit her hard with his belt. Note Makoti visited her father three weeks later and asked him for Precious. Her father did not like Note, and he did not want Precious to marry him. But Precious wanted to marry Note. He was not a good man, but perhaps she could change him. And there was something more. She felt that Note's child was deep inside her, like a tiny bird. After the wedding, Note and Precious lived in Gaborone. Precious went with Note to the bars, and he was kind to her. But he had many friends there who only talked about music. So Precious stopped going to the bars and stayed at home. One night. Note came home late, smelling of beer. He pushed Precious down on the bed and started hitting her with his belt. She cried out, but he was too strong. Don't hurt the baby, baby. Why do you talk about this baby? It is not mine. I am not the father of a baby. I will have to punish you now. He hurt her again, and she had to go to the hospital. The doctor there gave her medicine for the pain. When she returned home the next day, neither Note nor his music case was there. Precious went back to Machudi to her father. She stayed there looking after him for the next fourteen years. When Note's child was born, it lived for only five days. Her father died soon after her thirty-fourth birthday. She never saw Note again. Chapter Three, the missing husband. After her father's death, 
Myra Motswe went to see a lawyer. There is a lot of money for you from the sale of your father's cattle, he said. You can buy a house and a business. I am going to buy both of these, said Myra Motswe. What sort of business? asked the lawyer. A shop? A detective agency. The lawyer looked surprised. There are none for sale. I know that, said Myra Motswe. I will have to start from the beginning. It's easy to lose money in business, said the lawyer. Can women be detectives? Do you think they can? Why not? said Myra Motswe. Women understand what's happening. They are the ones with eyes. Have you heard of Agatha Christie? Agatha Christie? said the lawyer. Of course I know her. Yes, that is true. A woman sees more than a man. So, said Myra Motswe, when people see a sign, Number One Ladies Detective Agency, what will they think? They'll think, those ladies will understand what's happening. Mara Motswe found a house in a road called Zebra Drive. It was a fine house, but it was expensive. Then she looked for a place for the business. That was more difficult, but at last she found a small building near Kagale Hill. It was a good place because people walked down that road on their way into town. There was a lot to do. Mara Motswe painted the building red on the outside and white on the inside, and then she bought two desks and two chairs. Her friend, Mr. J. L. B. Matticoni, owner of Tlockwang Road Speedy Cars, brought her an old typewriter that he did not need. Next, she had to find a secretary. She telephoned the Botswana College of Secretarial and Office Skills. They had the perfect woman, they said. Her name was Ma Makutsi, and she had the best examination result of 97%. Ma Makutsi was a thin woman with a long face, large glasses, and a warm smile. Ma Ramotswe liked her immediately. They opened the office on a Monday. Ma Ramotswe sat at her desk and Ma Makutsi sat at hers, behind the typewriter. She looked at Ma Ramotswe and smiled. I am ready for work, she said. I am ready to start. Hmm, said Ma Ramotswe. We have only just opened. We will have to wait for a client to come. Mara Motswe was worried. Was the detective agency a terrible mistake? Nobody wanted a private detective, and nobody wanted her. She was just precious Ramotswe from Machudi. A chicken came into the room and started to look for food. Get out! shouted Mama Kutsi. No chickens in here! At ten o'clock, Mama Kutsi got up from her desk. She went into the back room to make the tea. At eleven o'clock, they had another cup. At twelve o'clock, Mara Motswe decided to walk down the road to the shops. She was standing in a shop when Mama Kutsi hurried through the door. Mara Motswe, she said, there is a client in the office. She has a big problem, a missing man. Come quickly. The client was called Mama Latsi. Mama Kutsi made a cup of strong tea while Mama Latsi talked to Mara Motswe. My husband is missing, she said. His name is Peter Malatsi. He's 40 and he has had, has a business selling furniture. It's a good business and he has done well. So he hasn't run away because he has problems with money. You know what men are like, said Ma Ramotswe carefully. Another woman, perhaps? Do you think... Ma Malatsi shook her head. 
I don't think so, she said. My husband joined a Christian group a year ago. I don't know who they are. He was usually with them on a Sunday. In fact, he disappeared on a Sunday. I thought he was at church. This was not a difficult problem, thought Mara Motsway. Peter Malazzi was with a young Christian woman. She was sure about that. She made a list of five Christian groups and went to see the head of each group. The first three knew nothing about Peter Malazzi. But then she went to see the head of the fourth group, the Reverend Shadrach Mapelli. Are you from the police? asked the Reverend in a worried voice. Are you a policeman? Police woman, said Mara Motswe. No, I'm a private detective. Who sent you? Mama Latsi. Oh, said the Reverend. He had no wife, he said. Well, he did, said Mara Motswe. And she wants to know where he is. He's dead, said the Reverend sadly. You must tell me how it happened, said Ma Ramotswe. The Reverend took Ma Ramotswe to the river. It was the rainy season, and the water in the river was very high. We have our baptisms here, said the Reverend. On that Sunday, I was baptizing Peter and five other people. They were standing in the water. I was following them. But then I turned round. When I turned back again, Peter wasn't there. Mara Motsway looked at the water. It was not a big river, but in the rainy season it could be dangerous. But where was Peter Malazzi's body? Suddenly she had a terrible idea. You didn't tell the police, she said to the Reverend. Why not? The Reverend looked down at the ground. If people find out about poor Peter's accident, I will have to go to court, he said. Perhaps I will have to pay a lot of money. Then our church will not have any money, and we will not be able to continue our good work. Do you understand? Mara Motswe touched the Reverend on the arm. I don't think that you acted badly, she said. The Reverend smiled. Those are kind words, my sister, he said. Thank you. Mara Motswe drove back home. She had a neighbour with five dogs. I need a dog to help me with my work, said Mara Motswe. Can I borrow one of yours? I'll give you this dog here, said the neighbour. He's the oldest, and he has a very good nose. He will make a good detective dog. Mara Motswe took the dog. It was large and yellow, and had a bad smell. That night, she put it into her van and drove to the river. She also took her father's gun. She pushed a thick stick into the soft ground near the river and tied the dog to the stick. Then she waited. Two hours passed. Then suddenly the dog made a noise. It was standing and looking towards the river. Something was coming out of the water. It was a large crocodile. The crocodile moved slowly towards the frightened dog. Then Myra Motswe picked up the gun, pointed it carefully and shot the crocodile. The crocodile gave a big jump into the air, fell and landed on its back in the water. Then it stopped moving. Mara Motswe's hand was shaking as she put the gun down. She did not like to shoot animals. Poor crocodile. No crocodiles usually came to this river. What was it doing there? She took a knife and cut the crocodile's soft stomach open. Inside, there were some pieces of smelly fish. 
there was also a man's watch. The next day, Mara Motswe visited Mama Latsi. She explained about the crocodile. Did this belong to your husband? She asked, handing her the watch. Mama Latsi took the watch and looked at it. Yes, she said calmly. Well, now I know that he is dead, not in the arms of another woman. That's better, isn't it? I think it is, Mara Motswe agreed. Chapter Four, the teacher's letter. Mara Motswe was pleased with the success of the Number One Ladies Detective Agency. The first mystery, the mystery of the missing husband, was solved. Mama Kutsi typed a report and also a bill. Then the bill was sent to Mama Latsi. It was Mama Kutsi's job to open the letters, but in the first week of the agency, there were very few letters. Then one day in the second week, a letter arrived in a dirty white envelope. Mama Kutsi read it to Ma Ramotswe. Dear. Ma Ramotswe, I read about your agency in the newspaper. I am very proud for Botswana that we now have a person like you in this country. I am the teacher at the small school at Katsana Village, fifty kilometers from Gaborone. My wife and I have two daughters, and a son of eleven. But two months ago, my son disappeared. We went to the police. They made a big search and asked questions everywhere, but nobody knew anything about our son. I searched the land around our village, but I could not find him. I called and called, but my son never answered me. He knew many things about the land, and he was always very careful. There are no dangerous wild animals near us. How can a boy disappear like this? I am not a rich man. I have no money to pay a private detective. But I ask you, Ma, to help me in one small way. When you are asking people about other things, please ask them about my son. If you hear anything, please send a note to me, the teacher at Katsana Village, Ernest Mole Bakotati. Ma Mukutsi stopped reading, and looked at Ma Ramotswe. Do you know anything about this? Asked Mara Motswe. Have you heard anything about a missing boy? I think so," said Mama Kutsi. "There was something in the newspaper about a search for a boy. I can ask people," Mara Motswe said. "But I don't think I can do very much for this poor daddy." "No," said Mama Kutsi. "We can't help that poor man." They sent a letter to the teacher, but when Mara Motswe was cooking supper in her house in Zebra Drive that evening, she thought again about the missing boy. Where could the boy be? Perhaps he was in danger somewhere. It was terrible for the teacher and his wife. Was the child stolen by a stranger? How could anyone do that to a young child? How could these bad things happen in Botswana? Perhaps I should not be a detective," she thought. "I want to help people, but sometimes their problems make me too sad." The next day, Mara Motswe went to see her friend, Mr. J. L. B. Matikoni. Mr. J. L. B. Matikoni was forty-five, ten years older than Mara Motswe, and came from the same village, Machudi. He was very good at repairing cars. His business, Tlokweng Road Speedy Cars, was very successful. Mr. J. L. B. Matikoni was not handsome, but he had a very kind face. Mara Motswe liked to go to his garage to drink tea. They always talked about local news. Today, they talked about the problems of owning a business. Mara Motswe was worried 
because the number one ladies' detective agency was not making enough money. Your secretary, the one with the big glasses, said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. She is costing you a lot of money. I know, said Mara Motswe. But you need a secretary if you have an office. Then you need to get better clients," said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. "You need someone rich to bring you a problem. Rich men have their troubles too." "I had a letter last week," said Mara Motswe. "It made me very sad because I couldn't help the man." She told Mr. J. L. B. Matacone about the teacher's letter. I read about that missing boy in the newspaper," he said. "But it is useless to search for him." "Why?" asked Ma Ramotswe. Mr. J. L. B. Matacone was silent. "Because that boy is dead," he said at last. "No animal took him." Ma Ramotswe was silent too, thinking of the teacher. She was remembering the time when her own child died. It was like the end of your world. The stars went out, and the moon disappeared. The birds became silent. Why do you say that he is dead? She asked. Perhaps he is lost. No, said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. A witch doctor has taken him. Mara Motswe put her cup down on the table. How can you be sure? You know what happens, Mara Motswe," said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. "We Africans don't like to talk about it, do we? It is a subject that brings fear to our hearts. We know what happens to missing children. We know." Mara Motswe looked up at him. Mr. J. L. B. Matacone was probably right. A witch doctor took the boy and killed him. Then his body was used for medicine, muti, for a rich man. It was terrible that these things still happened in modern Botswana. You may be right," she said. "That poor boy." "Of course I'm right," said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. "And why do you think that poor man had to write that letter to you? The police are doing nothing to find out about the boy. They are afraid." We are all afraid. Maybe even you. Chapter Five, The Boyfriend. One morning, Mara Motswe received a telephone call from Mr. Paliwala Patel, one of the richest men in Botswana. Mr. Patel was from an Indian family. When he was twenty-five. He came to Botswana. He bought a shop. Now he owned eight shops and a hotel. Mr. Patel's youngest daughter, Nandira, was sixteen. She went to the Maruapula School in Gaborone, the best and most expensive private school in Botswana. Mr. Patel asked Mara Motswe to come and see him at home that evening. She was very pleased and excited. Before she went out, she telephoned Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. You told me to get a rich client, and now I have, Mr. Patel. He is a very rich man," said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. "He has four Mercedes Benzes, four." That evening, Mara Motswe drove to Mr. Patel's big house. In her tiny white van. When she met her client, she was very surprised. Mara Motswe was not tall, but Mr. Patel was even smaller than she was. He took her into his private office. "Sit down, please," said Mr. Patel, pointing to a comfortable armchair. "I am a man with a happy family." But I am worried about my youngest child, my little Nandira. She is doing well at school, but、oh, you know about young people, don't you? You know how young people are in these modern days. 
Yes, said Mara Motswe. They often bring a lot of worry to their parents. That's what is worrying me, said Mr. Patel angrily. That's what is happening, and I will not accept that, not in my family. Accept what? asked Mara Motswe. Boys, said Mr. Patel. My Nandira is seeing a boy in secret. She says it is not true, but I know that there is a boy. And this is not acceptable in this family, in this house. I want you to find out about this boy, and then I will speak to him. Why don't you ask Nandira about the young man? asked Mara Motswe. I have asked her for three or four weeks, said Mr. Patel. But she gives no answer. Mara Motswe looked down at her feet. She felt sorry for Mr. Patel's daughter. Her father wanted to protect her too much. I'll find out for you, she said at last. But I don't like the idea of watching a child. They must have their own lives. No! shouted Mr. Patel. My father still hit me when I was twenty-two. I am a modern lady, said Mara Motswe. So perhaps we have different ideas. But I have agreed to do as you have asked. Please show me a photograph of Nandira, so I will know her. No need, said Mr. Patel. You can meet her. But then she will know me, said Mara Motswe. I won't be able to follow her in secret. Ah, said Mr. Patel. You are right. You detectives are very clever men. Women, said Mara Motswe. The next afternoon, Mara Motswe waited outside Nandira's expensive private school. At twenty past three, Nandira came out of the school entrance, carrying her bag. Mara Motswe waited for a few minutes and then followed her slowly. At the end of the road, Nandira turned the corner. Mara Motswe followed Nandira round the corner. The road was empty. It was a quiet road with only three houses on each side. Has Nandira gone into one of those houses? thought Mara Motswe. Does her boyfriend live there? That evening, Mr. Patel telephoned her. Do you have any information to report to me yet? he asked. No, said Mara Motswe, but I hope I will be more successful tomorrow. Not very good, said Mr. Patel. Not very good. Well, I have something to report to you. Nandira came home three hours after school finished. Three hours! Then this evening, my wife found a note on the table. It said, See you tomorrow, Jack. Now, who is this Jack? Who is this person? Is that a girl's name? No, said Mara Motswe. It sounds like a boy. Exactly, said Mr. Patel. That is the boy, I think. Jack who? Where does he live? You must find out and tell me everything. The next afternoon, Mara Motswe waited again outside the school. At last, Nandira came out with a friend, and the two girls got into a blue car. The car drove away, and Mara Motswe followed it in her tiny white van. The blue car drove to the main shopping centre and parked outside the President Hotel. Mara Motswe parked the tiny white van too. She watched the two girls get out with an older woman. She's the mother of Nandira's friend, thought Mara Motswe. The girls looked in the window of a shoe shop. Then they walked up to the Botswana Book Centre and went inside. Mara Motswe followed them. The Book Centre was a popular meeting place for young people. But today there were very few customers inside. The girls were at the other end of the shop, looking at a shelf of language books. They were talking and laughing. Were they waiting for someone? 
Ma Ramotswe reached for a book. It was called Snakes of Botswana, and it had very good pictures. Ma Ramotswe started reading about dangerous snakes. Suddenly, she remembered the girls. She looked up quickly, but they were not there. She put the book back on the shelf and ran out into the square, but she could not see the girls anywhere. She ran back to the President Hotel and saw the blue car leaving, but only the mother was inside. There was a shop with a woman selling dresses. Did you see two girls come out of the book centre? asked Mara Motswe. One Indian girl and one African. I saw them, said the woman. They went over to the cinema. They went inside. Then they came out and went away. Thank you, said Ma Ramotswe, pressing a ten pula note into the woman's hand. She walked over to the cinema, and looked at the times of the films. There was a film that evening. When Ma Ramotswe got home, Mister Patel telephoned. My daughter says she is going out, he said. She is going to see a friend about some homework, but I know she is lying. Yes," said Mara Motswe. "I'm afraid she is, but I know where she's going. I shall be there. Don't worry." She is going to see this Jack," shouted Mister Patel. "Probably," said Mara Motswe. "But I will give you a report tomorrow." There were very few people in the cinema when Mara Motswe arrived. She sat in a seat at the back, waiting for Nandira and Jack. Nandira arrived five minutes before the film. She was alone. She stood in the doorway, looking round. Then she walked across to Mara Motswe, and sat down in the seat next to her. "Good evening, Ma," she said politely. I saw you this afternoon. I saw you outside my school. Then I saw you in the book centre. Then you asked the woman in the dress shop about me. She told me. So, why are you following me? Mara Motswe thought quickly. She decided to be honest with Nandira, so she told her about her father. He wants to find out if you are seeing boys. She said, "He's worried about it." Nandira looked pleased. "And are you?" asked Mara Motswe. "Are you going out with lots of boys?" "No," said Nandira quietly. "Not really." "But this Jack," asked Mara Motswe, "who is he?" "Jack doesn't exist," said Nandira. I want them, my family, to think I've got a boyfriend, somebody I chose, not somebody they chose for me. Do you understand that? Yes," said Mara Motswe, putting a hand on Nandira's arm. I understand. It's been a silly game, I know," Nandira said. "You will tell my father that Jack isn't real." Then perhaps he will leave me to live my own life. I don't know if he will listen to me," said Myra Motswe, "but I will try and talk to him." They watched the film together and both enjoyed it. Then Myra Motswe drove Nandira home in her tiny white van. Myra Motswe went to see Mr. Patel early the next morning. "You've got bad news for me." He said, "What is it? I am very worried. You will not understand a father's worries." Mara Motswe smiled. "The news is good," she said. "There is no boyfriend. Jack is not real. Nandira imagined a boyfriend because she wants to be freer. Give her time for her own life. Don't ask her questions all the time." Mr. Patel closed his eyes and thought. "Why should I do this?" he said. "Why should I accept these modern ideas?"
because if you don't, said Myra Motsway, she will look for a real boyfriend. Mr. Patel stood up. You are a very clever woman, he said, and I'm going to do as you suggest. I will leave her to live her life, and in two or three years I am sure that I can help her find a good husband. Yes, said Myra Motsway. You probably can. Myra Motsway often thought about Nandira when she drove past Mr. Patel's house. But she did not see Nandira again until nearly a year later. She was having coffee one Saturday morning at the President Hotel when someone touched her on the shoulder. She turned round and there was Nandira with a young man. He was about eighteen with a pleasant, open face. Myra Motsway, said Nandira in a friendly way. This is my friend. I don't think you have met him. The young man smiled and held out his hand. CD 2 Chapter 6 The Stolen Car Mara Motsway sent a bill for 2,000 Pula to Mr. Patel, and he paid it immediately. Mara Motsway was very pleased, because this was a lot of money. Three days later, another client came to see Mara Motsway. She was called Ma Pekwane, and she seemed very nervous. I'm worried that my husband has done a terrible thing, she said. Many men do terrible things, said Mara Motsway kindly. All wives are worried about their husbands. You are not alone. But this thing is very terrible, said Ma Pekwane. He has a stolen car. Are you sure that it is stolen? asked Mara Motsway. Did he tell you that? A man gave it to him, he said replied Ma Pekwane. This man had two Mercedes Benzes and only needed one. Ma Ramotswe laughed. How can men believe that we are so stupid? She looked at Ma Pekwane. Do you want me to tell you what to do? She asked. Is that what you want? No, said Ma Pekwane. I don't want that. I have decided what I want to do. I want to give the car back to its owner. You want to go to the police? asked Mara Motsway. You want to tell them that your husband is a thief? No, I don't want that. I want to give the car back to its owner without telling the police. Then they won't find out that my husband stole this car. But why have you come to me about this? asked Mara Motsway. How can I help? I want you to find out who owns that car, said Ma Pekwane. Then I want you to steal it from my husband and give it back to its owner. That's all. That evening, Mara Motsway telephoned Mr J. L. B. Matacone. Where do stolen Mercedes Benzes come from? she asked. From over the border in South Africa, said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. They are stolen in South Africa and brought to Botswana. They are painted with a different colour and their number plates are changed. Then they are sold cheaply or sent up to Zambia. How can you find out if a car is stolen? asked Ma Ramotswe. There's usually another number somewhere on the car, said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. You have to know where to look for this number. You have to know what you're doing. You know what you're doing, said Mara Motsway. Can you help me? Mr. J. L. B. Matacone did not like stolen cars. But Mara Motsway needed his help, and so there was only one answer. Tell me where and when, he said. The next evening, Mara Motsway and Mr. J. L. B. Matacone 
went into Ma Pequane's garden. The Mercedes Benz was parked outside the house. Mr. J. L. B. Matacone got down under the car, shone a light up into it, and found the number. Are you sure that's enough? asked Mara Motsway. Will they know from that number if this car is stolen? Yes, said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. They will know. Mara Motsway had an old school friend called Billy Palani. Now Billy was a police chief in South Africa. That weekend, Mara Motswe drove her tiny white van over the border to Mafikeng to see him. They met at the railway cafe, and she bought him a cup of coffee. Then she gave him a piece of paper with the number from the car on it. "I want you to find out who owns this car," she said. "Then I want you to tell the owner." Or the owner's insurance company to come up to Gaborone. They will find the car in an agreed place. They must bring the car's South African number plates. Then they can drive it home. Billy Palani looked surprised. "Isn't there any money to pay?" he asked. "No," said Mara Motswe. "We just have to get the car back to its owner. That's all." Billy Palani telephoned Mara Motswe the next day. "I have found that car on our list of stolen cars," he said. "The owner's insurance company are very happy to get it back. They will send one of their men to pick it up." "Good," said Mara Motswe. "The car will be outside the African shopping centre in Gaborone next Tuesday morning at seven o'clock." The man must come there with the number plates. Everything was agreed. At five o'clock on Tuesday morning, Mara Motswe went to the Pequane house. She found the keys of the car on the ground outside the bedroom window. Good, she thought. Ma Pequane has done as I asked. Mara Motswe started the car and drove it away. Ma Pequane's husband did not hear her. He did not notice that his Mercedes Benz was missing until almost eight o'clock. Call the police! Shouted Ma Pequane. Quick! Maybe later, said her husband slowly. First, I think I shall look for it. So I was right, thought Ma Pequane. He knows he can't go to the police about this car. The police will ask him a lot of questions. They will find out that the car is stolen. She saw Mara Motswe later that day and thanked her. I feel much better, she said. I will be able to sleep at night without worrying about my husband. I'm very pleased, said Mara Motswe. And maybe your husband has learned a lesson too. Mara Motswe was very happy with her detective agency and her lovely house in Zebra Drive. She enjoyed her life and had many friends. Her best friend was Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. One day, at his garage, they started talking about the past. I have made hundreds of mistakes in my life," said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone, pouring tea into Mara Motswe's cup. "I didn't know then what I know now." Mara Motswe looked at him in surprise. "You have your business, money in the bank, your own house," she said. "I can't see what mistakes you have made. Not like me." But you are too clever to make mistakes," said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. "I married Note." Mr. J. L. B. Matacone thought. "Yes," he said, "that was a bad mistake." They were silent. Then Mr. J. L. B. Matacone stood up. "I would like you to marry me," he said. That will not be a mistake. 
Mara Motsway hid her surprise. She smiled at her friend. You are a good, kind man, she said. You are like my daddy, a bit. But I cannot get married again, ever. I am happy as I am. I have got the agency and the house. My life is full. Mr. J. L. B. Matacone sat down. He looked very sad. Mara Motsway reached out to touch him, but he moved away, as a burned man moves away from a fire. I am very sorry, she said, but I don't want to marry anybody. Mr. J. L. B. Matacone took her cup and poured her more tea. He was silent now. He was not angry, but he had no more words. Chapter 7 A Missing Finger Mara Motsway knew the owner of one of the factories in Gaborone. Hector Lepidice asked Mara Motsway to meet him for coffee at the President Hotel. I have a problem, he said. One of my workers, Solomon Moretzi, left his job suddenly. A few weeks later, I had a letter from his lawyer up in Mahalapaye. He is asking me to pay Moretzi 4,000 pula. He says Moretzi lost a finger in an accident in my factory. And was there an accident? asked Mara Motsway. There is an accident book in the factory, said Hector. If anyone gets hurt, they must write it down in the book. I looked in the book. There was an accident some days before Moretzi left, but it was only a cut. Mara Motsway went to the factory with Hector and looked in the book. She read the information about Moretzi's accident. Moretzi cut his finger, number two finger counting from thumb. Machine did it. Right hand. Signed, Solomon Moretzi. Then she read the letter from Moretzi's lawyer. My client had an accident at your factory on the 10th of May. He went to the Princess Marina Hospital the next day, but the finger went bad. So the following week it was cut off. See hospital report. The accident happened because the machines in your factory are not safe. So you must pay my client 4,000 pula or he will go to a judge. Then you will have to pay more money. Mara Motsway read the hospital report. It had the right date, the paper looked real, and there was the signature of a doctor. So he cut his finger and it went bad, she said. What does your insurance company say? They have agreed to pay Moretzi 4,000 pula, said Hector. But I don't want to pay this man. I never liked him. And some of the other workers didn't like him either. I don't believe his story about losing a finger in my factory. But a man with a missing finger needs money, said Mara Motsway. Why don't you just pay him? Because if I pay him this time... Perhaps he will do the same thing again, said Hector. I don't think he is an honest man, but if I am wrong, then I will pay him. Is Moretzi lying? thought Mara Motsway. Did he lose his finger after the accident in Hector's factory or not? That night, she did not sleep well. It was very hot and the dogs in the town were making a lot of noise. She got up and made herself some tea, and thought about Moretzi. Then she had an idea. Perhaps Moretzi has received money from an insurance company before, she thought. There were six large insurance companies in Gaborone. Next morning, Mara Motsway telephoned them. The first three could not help her, but the fourth, the Kalahari Accident Insurance Company, had some interesting information. We had a claim about a man called Moretzi three years ago, said a woman from the company. It was from a garage in town. 
one of their workers lost a finger in an accident. The garage was insured with us, so we had to pay. Mara Motsway felt very excited. Four thousand pula? Nearly. Three thousand eight hundred. Right hand? asked Mara Motsway. Second finger counting from the thumb. There's a hospital report, said the woman. Yes, that's right. The finger went bad, so it was cut off. Mara Motsway put down the phone, feeling very pleased. So, Maretsi lost a finger before he started work in Hector's factory. Mara Motsway decided to drive to Mahalapaye. It was a two hour drive on a bad road, but she was happy to go there. She wanted to meet Maretsi and his lawyer. Mara Motsway left Mama Kutsi in the office. And drove up to Mahalapaye in the tiny white van. It was a very hot day. She drove past the hills to the east of Machudi and into the wide valley. All around there was nothing, just flat, empty country. Suddenly, a big green snake moved quickly across the road. Mara Motsway could not stop the van in time. She slowed down, looking behind her in the mirror. But she could not see the snake in the road. Where was it? She stopped the van, but she still could not see the snake. Perhaps it was somewhere in the van. Sometimes drivers picked up snakes without knowing. They did not see the snake in their car. Then the snake bit them. They died as they were driving. Mara Motsway got out of the tiny white van and stood next to it. Was the snake in the van? How could she get it out? The road was very quiet, but then she saw a car. As it came nearer, it slowed down. Are you in trouble, Ma? the driver called out politely. Ma r a m o t s w a y crossed the road and explained about the snake. The man turned off his engine and got out of the car. Snakes can get into the engine, he said. It can be dangerous. You were right to stop. He went over to the van and looked inside the engine. Don't move, he said very softly. There it is. Mara Motsway looked inside. At first, she could not see anything unusual. Then suddenly the snake moved a little and she saw it. Walk very carefully back to the door. Said the man. Get into the van and start the engine. Understand? Mara Motsway did as she was told. The engine started immediately. There was a noise from the front. After some time, the man told her to switch the engine off. You can come out, he called. That's the end of the snake. Mara Motsway got out of the van. And walked round to the front. She looked into the engine and saw the snake. It was cut into two pieces. You are safe now, said the man. Mara Motsue thanked him and drove off. This journey to Mahalapaye was becoming an adventure. When she got to Mahalapaye, she went to the lawyer's office. My client. Mr. Moretzi is going to be a little late," said the lawyer. Mara Motsway looked round the office. The room looked poor, with very little furniture. So business is not so good these days," she said. "It's not bad," said the lawyer angrily. "In fact, I am very busy. It probably takes a lot of time." Said Mara Motsway, listening to your clients' lies. My clients do not lie," said the lawyer slowly. "Oh no," said Mara Motsway. "What about Mr. Moretzi? How many fingers has he got?" "Nine," said the lawyer. 
or nine and a half. You know that. Very interesting," said Ma Ramotswe. So, how did he make a successful claim to Kalahari Accident Insurance Company three years ago? It was for a finger lost in an accident in a garage. Three years ago," said the lawyer in a weak voice. "A finger." Yes," said Mara Motswe. He asked for four thousand pula. The insurance company paid him three thousand eight hundred. The company gave me the claim number. If you want to check. The lawyer said nothing, and Mara Motswe felt sorry for him. He was just trying to do his job. Show me the report from the hospital," she said. The lawyer took out a report from his desk, and Mara Motswe looked at it. "Look," she said, "it's just as I thought. Look at the date there. Someone has changed it. Mr. Moretzi's finger was cut off once, perhaps as the result of an accident, but the date has changed, so now it looks like a new accident." The lawyer took the paper and held it up to the light. You could see the change in the date clearly. Just then, Moretzi arrived. "Sit down," said the lawyer coldly. Moretzi looked surprised, but he did as he was told. "So you're the lady who is going to pay," he began. "She has not come to pay anything," said the lawyer. "She has come to ask you a question." Why do you claim for lost fingers all the time? Yes," said Mara Motswe. "You claim, I believe, that you lost three fingers, but if I look at your hand, I see only one missing finger. This is wonderful. Perhaps you know a drug that grows new fingers. Three fingers?" asked the lawyer in surprise. Yes," said Ma Rumotswe. There was the Kalahari Accident Insurance Company, and then there was, oh, what was the name of the other company? I've forgotten. Star Insurance," said Moretzi quietly. "Ah," said Ma Rumotswe. "Thank you for that." The lawyer waved the hospital report at Moretzi. That is the end of your game," he said angrily. "Why did you do it?" asked Mara Motswe. "Just tell me." "I am looking after my parents," said Moretzi, "and I have a sister who is sick with a terrible illness, the illness that is killing everybody these days. I have to look after her children." Mara Motswe looked into his eyes. Moretzi was not lying. If Moretzi goes to prison, his parents and sister will suffer more. She thought. All right, she said. I will not tell the police about this. But you must promise that there will be no more lost fingers. Do you understand? Yes, said Moretzi quickly. You are a good lady. But sometimes, I can be a very unpleasant lady," said Mara Motswe, looking at the lawyer. Some people in this country, some men, think that women are soft. Well, I'm not. I killed a big snake on the way here today. Oh," said the lawyer. "There's one thing that I would like to know," said Mara Motswe as she left the office. "That car." Who owned it? Mr. J. L. B. Matacone kept his voice low while he told her. Charlie got so, he said. Him, that one. Mara Motswe opened her eyes wide in surprise. Got so. Everyone knew Charlie got so. He was one of the most important men in Botswana. You always did what he asked. If you did not. Life could become very difficult for you. Oh," said Mara Motswe. 
Exactly, said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. Mara Motswe put the envelope with the bone in her desk. She left it there for a few days, but she could not forget about it. She did not want Ma Makutsi to see it. It was too dangerous. So she took the bone out of her desk and left the office. I'm going to the bank, she told Ma Makutsi. But Mara Motswe did not go to the bank. She drove to the Princess Marina Hospital. She had a friend there, Dr. Gulabane. Dr. Gulabane was very pleased to see her. Come with me to my office, he said. We can talk there. Mara Motswe followed him to his small office. As you know, she began, I'm a private detective these days. Can you tell me where this bone came from? She took out the envelope and opened it. The small bone fell out and Dr. Gulabane picked it up. It's from a child, he said. Eight or nine years old. Where did you get it? Mara Motswe could hear the sound of her own heart. Somebody showed it to me, she said. But can you tell me anything more? Do you know when. when the child died? Dr. Gulabane looked at the bone again. <sighs> Not long ago, he said. Maybe a few months. Maybe less. You can't be sure. But how do you know that the child is dead? People can lose a finger and still live. That evening, Mara Motswe invited Mr. J. L. B. Matacone to dinner. She told him about her conversation with Dr. Gulabane. A child? said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone sadly. Yes, said Mara Motswe. What do we do? Mr. J. L. B. Matacone thought for a time. He did not want any trouble with a man like Charlie Gotso. We can go to the police, he said at last, but then Charlie Gotso will hear that I found the bag in his car. I don't think we can go to the police, said Mara Motswe, but we can't just forget about this child. I have a plan. Charlie Gotso's car is still in your garage. First, you must break the window of the car. Then telephone Charlie Gotso. Tell him thieves broke into his car. Tell him you will pay for a new window. Then wait and see. To see what? Perhaps he will tell you that something is missing from the car. Tell him that you know a lady private detective. Tell him she can help him. That's me, of course. And then? Then I'll take the bag back to him and get the name of the witch doctor from him. Then we'll think what to do next. Mara Motswe's plan sounded very simple. So the next morning, Mr. J. L. B. Matacone did as Mara Motswe asked. He broke a window of Charlie Gotso's car and telephoned Charlie Gotso. In the afternoon, a visitor arrived at his garage. He was dressed like a soldier and wore an expensive snakeskin belt. Mr. Gotso sent me, he said. He is very angry that someone has broken into his car in your garage. I'm very sorry, Ra, said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone nervously. All right, all right, said the man. Just show me the car. Mr. J. L. B. Matacone took the man to the car. The man opened the door and looked inside. Then he opened the box in front of the passenger seat. There is something missing from here, he said. Do you know anything about that? Mr. J. L. B. Matacone shook his head. Mr. Gotso will not be pleased about this, said the man. I know someone who can help, said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. There's a lady detective. She has an office near Kagale Hill. Mr. J. L. B. Matacone smiled. <sighs> She's a wonderful lady. 
she knows about everything that's happening. If I ask her, she'll be able to find out about this thing. She'll find out what happened to it. Perhaps she can even get it back. What is it, this thing? Something that belongs to Mr. Gotso, replied the man. Can you ask that lady? Ask her to get this thing back to Mr. Gotso? I will ask, said Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. I am sure that she can help. But Mr. J. L. B. Matacone did not feel happy. This is dangerous and not my business, he thought. I will tell Mara Motswe that I repair cars. I cannot repair people's lives. He went to the number one ladies' detective agency. Well, asked Mara Motswe, did everything go as we planned? Mara Motswe, I really think. Did Charlie Gotso come round, or did he send one of his men? One of his men. But listen, I am just. And did you tell him about me? Did he seem interested? I repair machines. I cannot. You see, I have never lied. I have never lied before, even when I was a small boy. You have done very well this time, said Mara Motswe. Lies are all right if you are lying for a good reason, and the search for a child's murderer is a very good reason. A lie is worse than murder, Mr. J. L. B. Matacone. Do you think that? Murder is worse, but. You didn't think about it carefully, did you? Now you know. She looked at him and smiled, and he thought, I am lucky. Here is somebody who likes me. Somebody who smiles at me. And she's right. Murder is worse than lies. Come in for tea, said Mara Motswe. We must decide what to do next. The next day, Mara Motswe went to see Charlie Gotso. Charlie Gotso liked fat women, and he looked at her with interest. You are the woman from Matacone? Mr. J. L. B. Matacone asked me to help him, Ra. I am a private detective. Mr. Gotso smiled. I have seen your sign. A private detective agency for ladies or something like that. Not just for ladies, Ra, said Mara Motswe. We are lady detectives, but we work for men too. Mr. Patel, for example. Mr. Gotso smiled again. You think you can tell men things? Mara Motswe answered calmly. Sometimes, but some men are too proud to listen. We can't tell that sort of man anything. Mr. Gotso narrowed his eyes. What did she mean? Was she talking about him or other men? You know I lost something from my car, he said. Do you know who took it? Can you get it back for me? I have done that, said Mara Motswe. I found out who broke into your car. They were only boys. They gave the thing to me. Where is it? asked Mr. Gotso. Mara Motswe reached into her handbag and took out the small bag. She put it on the table. Mr. Gotso reached across and took it. This is not mine, of course. I was looking after it for one of my men. I have no idea what it is. Muti Ra, a witch doctor's medicine. I think it is very expensive and very strong. I would like some medicine like that, but I do not know where I can find it. Mr. Gotso moved a little. Maybe I can help you, Ma. Mara Motswe thought quickly and then gave her answer. I would like you to help me. Then maybe I can help you in some way. In what way can you help me? I think you are a man who likes information, and I hear some very interesting things in my business. For example, I can tell you about that man who is trying to build a shop next to yours in the shopping centre. 
He did some bad things before he came to Gaborone. He wouldn't like people to know, I think. You are a very interesting woman, Mara Motsway, said Mr. Gotso. I think I understand you very well. I will give you the name of the witch doctor if you give me this useful information. He picked up a small piece of paper. I'm going to draw you a map. This witch doctor lives out in the country, not far from Molopolole. Chapter 8 The Bone Myra Motsway did not want Mr. J. L. B. Matacone as a husband, but she liked him very much as a friend. He was her best friend in Gaborone, and she did not want to lose him. A few days later, she went to see him. But Mr. J. L. B. Matacone was very quiet and did not say very much. He did not seem to be listening and was looking out of the window. Perhaps he is angry because I didn't want to marry him, thought Myra Motswe. Are you worried about something? she asked. What are you thinking about? Mr. J. L. B. Matacone stood up and closed the door. I have found something, he said. There was an accident. It was not a bad one. Nobody was hurt. A lorry hit a car and pushed it off the road. Mr. J. L. B. Matacone sat down and looked at his hands. And, said Myra Motswe, I brought the car to my garage for repair. I'll show it to you later. I checked everything in the car. When I was checking the electric parts, I opened the box in front of the passenger seat and I found something inside a little bag. He took out a small bag and put it on the table. The bag was made of animal skin. I'll open it, he said. I don't want you to touch it. He opened the bag and took out three small things. There was a strange smell coming from them. Now Mara Motswe understood. Mr. J. L. B. Matacone did not have to say anything more. The things were Muti, the medicine of a witch doctor. She said nothing as the things were placed on the table. There was a small bone a piece of skin, and a wooden bottle. Mr. J. L. B. Matacone touched the things with a pencil. Chapter 9. The Careless Doctor Myra Motswe had the information now to find a murderer, but there was another mystery to solve. One of Myra Motswe's friends, Dr. McKetsy, was a doctor at the Princess Marina Hospital. One evening, he called into her office on his way home from work. I am worried about one of our young doctors, Dr. Komoti, he said. He came here about six months ago. At first, everything was fine. But then he started making mistakes. Some days his work is very good, but the next day he makes a bad mistake. Are you sure that he is really a doctor? asked Myra Motswe. Oh, yes, said Dr. McKetsy. Before he came to Botswana, he worked in a hospital in Nairobi. I telephoned that hospital. His work was very good, they said. They even sent me a photograph of him. I'm sure that it is the same man. Can't you just test him, said Myra Motswe. You could ask him some difficult questions. I've done that, said Dr. McKetsy. The first time, he gave very good answers, but the second time, he didn't know how to answer my questions. I'm afraid that he is taking drugs. I'm not sure that I can help, said Mara Motswe. Drugs are a business for the police. What do you want me to do? Find out about him said Dr. McKetsy. Follow him. If he is taking drugs, it will be a big problem for the hospital. 
Dr. Mackenzie gave Mara Motswe Dr. Komoti's address, his photograph, and the number of his car number plate. She started following him two days later. She sat outside the hospital in her tiny white van, and waited for him in the evenings. But Dr. Komoti always went straight home and stayed there. Then on Friday afternoon, things changed. Dr. Komoti came out of the hospital and got into his car, but this time he did not go home. He turned towards the Labatse Road. This is interesting, thought Mara Motswe. Labatse was close to the border with South Africa. Was Dr. Komoti passing drugs into South Africa, or picking them up from there? But Dr. Komoti. Did not stop in Labatse. Mara Motswe was worried. Was he going to Mafikeng in South Africa? Mara Motswe watched Dr. Komoti drive across the border. She could not follow him because she did not have her passport. So she went back to Gaborone, feeling angry with herself. Dr. Komoti was in South Africa, and she had to stay in Botswana. The next day, Mara Motswe went into town, and had a cup of coffee with a friend at the President Hotel. As she was walking down the front steps, she saw Doctor Komoti. Mara Motswe was very surprised. He went to South Africa only yesterday evening, she thought. Why did he come back to Botswana so soon? The next day, Doctor Komoti drove to South Africa again. This time, Mara Motswe followed him across the border. In Mafikeng, Doctor Komoti stopped outside a house with a large garden and went into one of the houses. Mara Motswe drove past and parked the van under a tree. Then she walked back to the house. She pushed the garden gate open carefully and went into the garden. It was very large and untidy. Suddenly, a window at the back of the house opened, and a man looked out. It was Doctor Komoti. You, yes, you, fat lady. What are you doing in our garden? It is hot. Mara Motswe called out. Can you give me a drink of water? The window closed, and a few minutes later, the kitchen door opened. Doctor Komoti stood on the step, holding a cup of water. He gave it to Mara Motswe. She drank the water gratefully. What do you want? He said. Are you looking for work? Suddenly, another man came behind Doctor Komoti and looked over his shoulder. It was another Doctor Komoti. What does this woman want? Said the second Doctor Komoti. I was looking at this house, said Mara Motswe. I lived here when I was a child. My mother worked in this house as a cook, and my father kept the garden tidy. It was better then. We have no time to look after the garden," said one of the doctor commotes. "We are busy men. We are both doctors, you see." Ah," said Mara Motswe, "here at the hospital." No. Said the first Doctor Komoti, "I work down near the railway station. My brother, I work out that way." Said the other Doctor Komoti, pointing to the north. "You can look at the garden as much as you like." "You are very kind," said Mara Motswe. "Thank you." Mara Motswe spent a few minutes in the garden, then walked away. So. There were two Doctor Komotis, twin brothers, but it was not unusual for two brothers to study medicine. She drove to the railway station and stopped the van outside. She saw a woman selling food and sweet drinks. "I am looking for a doctor called Doctor Komoti," she said. "Do you know where his place is?" The woman pointed to a building across a dusty square. Over there," she said. "Many people go to that doctor." Mara Motswe thanked the woman, 
and walked across the square. The door of the building was not locked. She pushed it open and found a woman inside. I'm sorry, but the doctor isn't here, Ma," said the woman. "I am the nurse. You can see the doctor on Monday afternoon." I just wanted to say hello to Doctor Komoti," said Mara Motswe. "I worked for him when he was in Nairobi. I was a nurse in the hospital there." Do you know the other Doctor Komoti, the brother? Oh yes," said the nurse. She was more friendly now. He often comes in here to help, two or three times a week. Mara Motswe put down her cup very slowly. Oh, they did that up in Nairobi too," she said carelessly. One doctor helped the other. And usually the patients didn't know that they were seeing a different doctor. The nurse laughed. <laughs> They do it here too, she said. Nobody has realised that there are two doctors. Everyone seems happy, but only one of them is a good doctor. I'm surprised that the other one passed his examinations. Myra Motswe thought, but did not say. He didn't. She went back to Gaborone the next day, and telephoned Doctor Maketsi. He came to her office immediately. Doctor Komoti is not taking drugs, she said, but he has a twin brother. One of the brothers passed his examinations and became a doctor. The other didn't. The doctor took two jobs, here and in South Africa. When he wasn't working in the hospital. The other man, his brother, did his work for him. Doctor Maketsi sat silent, with his head in his hands. So, we've had both doctors in our hospital, he said. Only one is a real doctor, but he gets paid for two jobs. I'll have to go to the police, but this will be very bad for our hospital. People will be afraid to go there now. I agree with you," said Mara Motswe. "We must protect people. Why don't we tell the police in South Africa, not the police in Gaborone? I shall telephone my friend, Billy Palani. He is a police chief down there. It will be in the newspapers in South Africa, but people in Gaborone won't find out about it. That's a very good idea," said Doctor Maketsi. Smiling warmly at his old friend. Chapter Ten, The Witch Doctor's Wife. Mara Motswe had to find out about the school teacher's missing son, so she drove out to the witch doctor's place in her tiny white van. It was in a very empty part of the country, with no animals and only a few small trees. Suddenly. She saw the house by the side of a hill. She parked the van and got out. She felt afraid. She knew many different kinds of people, but this man was a murderer. The sun was high in the sky as she walked towards the house. She felt that someone was watching her. There was a low wall around the house. At the wall, she stopped and called out, "I am very hot." She said loudly, "I need water." There was no reply from inside the house. Mara Motswe heard a noise behind her and turned round. Ma. She turned round again quickly. A woman was standing in the doorway. "I am Mara Motswe," she said. "I have come to see your husband. I want to ask him for something." I have heard he is a very good doctor. I have trouble with another woman. She is taking my husband from me, and I want something to stop her. The woman smiled. He can help you, but he is away. He is in Labatse until Saturday. You will have to come back. This has been a long trip," said Mara Motswe. "I am thirsty." Do you have water, sister? Yes, I have water. 
you can sit in the house while you drink it. Mara Motswe went into the house. The room inside was small, with a table and two chairs. She sat on a chair and drank the water gratefully. Then she put down the cup and looked at the woman. I am here because you are in danger, she said. I am a typist. I work for the police, and I have typed out something about your husband. He killed that boy, the one from Katsana. He used the boy for Muti. The police know this. They are going to catch your husband, and then they will kill him. They are going to kill you too. But I don't think they should kill women. Come to the police with me now. Tell them what happened, or you will die very soon. Next month, I think. Do you understand? She stopped. The woman looked at her with eyes wide with fear. I did not kill that boy, she said. I know, said Mara Motswe, but that doesn't make any difference to the police. The government wants to kill you too. Your husband first, you later. They do not like witch doctors. But the boy is not dead, said the woman quickly. My husband took him to the cattle farm. He is working there. He is still alive. Mara Motswe opened the door of the tiny white van and told the woman to get inside. It was one o'clock, and the seats inside the van were very hot. Then they drove to the cattle farm. It was a difficult journey of about four hours across empty country. At last, they saw some trees around two small buildings. That is the cattle farm, said the woman. There are two Basarwa there, a man and a woman. The boy works for them. How do you stop him running away? Look around you, said the woman. You can see how lonely this place is. If he runs away, the Basarwa will catch him easily. There is a man in Gaborone who bought a bone from your husband. Said Mara Motswe. Where did you get that? You can buy bones in Johannesburg, said the woman. Did you not know that? They are not expensive. The Basarwa were eating a meal. They were tiny people with skin dry from the sun and wide eyes. They looked at the visitors in surprise. Then the man stood up. Are the cattle all right? asked the witch doctor's wife. All right, said the man. They are not dead. Where is the boy? Over there, replied the man. Look. They saw a boy standing under a tree. He was a dusty little boy with a stick in his hand. Come here, called the witch doctor's wife. Come here. The boy walked over to them, looking at the ground. He had a deep cut on his arm. Mara Motswe put a hand on his shoulder. What is your name? she asked very quietly. Are you the teacher's son from Katsana village? The boy shook with fear, but he answered, I am that boy. I work here now. I have to look after the cattle. Did this man hit you? asked Mara Motswe quietly. All the time, said the boy. You are safe now, said Mara Motswe. You are coming with me, right now. Walk in front of me. I will look after you. The boy looked at the Basarwa and then moved towards the van. That's right, said Mara Motswe. I am coming too. She put him in the passenger seat and closed the door. Then she got into the driver's seat. And started the engine. Wait for me! shouted the witch doctor's wife. But the van drove away. Mara Motswe turned towards the frightened little boy. I am taking you home now, she said. It will be a long journey. At Katsana village the next day, the school teacher looked out of the window of his house and saw a tiny white van. He saw a woman get out of the van and look at his door. 
There was a child in the van. Was the woman a parent who was bringing a child to him? He went outside. You are the teacher, Ra. I am the teacher, ma'am. Can I do anything for you? She turned to the van and waved to the child inside. The door opened and the boy came out. The teacher cried out and ran forward. He shouted wildly for the world to hear his happiness. Mara Motswe walked back towards the van. She was crying, remembering her own dead child. There was so much suffering in Africa. Sometimes you just wanted to walk away. But you can't do that, she thought. You just can't. There was something wrong with the tiny white van. It's the dust from the journey to the cattle farm, thought Mara Motswe. She telephoned to Lockwain Road Speedy Cars. I will come to Zebra Drive and look at the van on Saturday, said Mr. J.L.B. Matacone. It is an old van, said Mara Motswe. I will have to sell it. No, said Mr. J.L.B. Matacone. Everything can be repaired. He suddenly felt sad. Even a broken heart, he thought. Who can repair that? He arrived shortly after four o'clock on Saturday. I'll make you a cup of tea, said Mara Motswe. You can drink it while you look at the van. From the window, she watched him work. She took out two cups of tea and then a third, as it was a hot afternoon. Then she went into her kitchen and put vegetables into a pot and watered the plants. It was her favourite time of day, when the afternoon was changing into evening. She went out to see Mr. J.L.B. Matacone. He was standing next to the little white van. It will be fine now, he said. The engine runs well. Mara Motswe was very pleased. She went into her kitchen and poured Mr. J.L.B. Matacone a glass of beer. They sat outside the house together. Not far away, they could hear music from another house. The sun went down, and it was dark. He looked at her, this woman who was everything to him. I am very happy that I repaired your van, he said. I am very happy sitting here with you. She turned to him. What did you say? I said, please marry me, Mara Motswe. I am just Mr. J. L. B. Matacone, that's all. But please marry me and make me happy. Of course 